If you can say not a creature is stirring, not even a mouse, then maybe you're one of those who works in a good research lab, virtuous and ethical, one that doesn't test on animals. Unfortunately, most research labs do use animals, and the creatures aren't just stirring, they're subject to testing, run by vivisectors, animal experimenters, and what they do for a living makes the Grinch look saintly. They are people like Harvard's Dr. Margaret Livingstone, who still to this day continue to spend millions of taxpayer dollars torturing animals in the name of science, how the system works, and how to change it. An actual scientist tells us how, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights, brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, Dr. Margaret Livingstone at Harvard continues new research where she deprives monkeys of their vision for curiosity's sake. Her findings have little to no relevance to humans, but she keeps getting millions in federal grants anyway. The grants, the bad science, tortured monkeys, most of whom are killed after the experiment, and then the cycle begins again. New grants, more dead monkeys. Dr. Catherine Rowe, a former NIH researcher and now a PETA scientist, says that's the way the system works. But it doesn't have to be that way. Dr. Rowe says most young scientists feel trapped and are forced to believe in a failed science model. In my conversation with Dr. Rowe, she outlines what changes can be made and how you can stop the experimenters. On this edition of the PETA podcast, Dr. Rowe begins by talking about how she avoided becoming a vivisector herself. It was honestly just luck. So I'll date myself, but back in the early 90s when I was an undergraduate, so many, many, many years ago, I was I made the choice to pursue graduate school. I decided that I wanted to be a biomedical researcher as opposed to going into medical school. Those were sort of the two things I, I was choosing between so when I decided I did want to become a researcher, my advisor at the time said, well, you know, you've got the grades and everything, but you need research experience. Like if you want to get into graduate school, the most important prerequisite is having conducted research as an undergraduate. So you need to go work with somebody in a lab. And he asked me, you know, what are you interested in? And I gave him the answer I had at the time at, you know, 19, which was I'm interested in the brain. And he said, okay, okay. Um, Oh, there's this this one person who would be perfect for you. He does he does brain research with monkeys. He said, "Oh, you know what though? He's retiring. He's retiring. So, oh, you should go work with this other woman who does research with humans." And so that's what I did. Just like that, on a whim almost, or, or the the convenience factor of this guy's not going to be around, but she's going to be around. That's how you decide. That's how it was decided. And it wasn't even really decided by me. I, at that time, at that age, would have done whatever they told me to do. So if they said, go and work with this monkey experimenter, I would have done it. And I, you know, it's something I talk about with my colleagues a lot because I reflect on that. I think to myself, had that person not been retiring or had they decided, oh, you know, you know, if the next choice on the list was another vivisector, would I be currently working in a monkey lab? Would I have the same perspective I do now, which is that this is morally unacceptable and, and scientifically problematic? Or would I be, you know, somebody who PETA was trying to shut down? Do you think about that a lot? I really do. I mean, it's part of my job I do a lot of things with PETA. You know, one of them is is making sure that the public is aware of how very invasive experiments are and how very uh, limited they are in terms of translating into human treatments or cures. But the other thing that I try to do is convince people who are working with animals, who are experimenting on animals, to transition away, to to point out to them how ethically problematic what they're doing is. Um, and we see time after time that that people who are experimenting on animals won't entertain 
that possibility at all. And so that mindset, that like locked in mindset of no, what I'm doing is important. What I'm doing is okay. Has to get built, right? Like, like that has been built up in them over years. And, and I do, I, I have to wonder, would that have happened to me? Would I have questioned what I was doing if I was experimenting on animals? And would I have convinced myself in order to get my research experience and get into grad school and then get my, you know, all of the, all of the, the hoops that you have to go through to be part of the scientific community, would I have convinced myself that it was okay? And, and tell me about your contemporaries, other students who are in the same situation and maybe didn't have the kind of thing happen to them as you. I mean, you, it was clear you're going to go with the, the clinical person because the monkey experimenter was retiring. What if the choice had not been that way for others? And did they go down that other path? They would. And a lot of people do. I mean, the choice is, again, the younger you are in the in your research career, meaning if you're an undergraduate or a grad student, you don't have that many choices, right? It's not the case that every laboratory is open to you and that you're going to have the opportunity to work in any lab you choose. You're going to have the opportunity to work in a lab that has a position open, that is interested in you. And so you often have that choice made for you. And so I consider myself lucky that I wasn't assigned basically to a lab that uses animals because I think a lot of people find themselves in that position and never, ever escape it. Even if they think that they might, even if they think that, oh, I'll just do this for my undergraduate research or I'll just do this for my degree. Once you start accumulating that type of experience, so let's say vivisection experience or, or working with mice or working with monkeys or zebrafish or birds, whatever it is, that's your that's your background now. And so somebody who's working with humans isn't going to hire somebody who's, who's past experiences with mice. And it, so you get locked in from a very, very early stage in your career. And that early stage is basically, uh, you know, the role of a diet. You could end up doing really, really human relevant, you know, ethically sane research with humans, or you could end up doing some of the absolute worst vivisection we've ever seen. And and you won't have had a choice when that choice was made for you. So what percentage of these young researchers or researchers in their career would you say get trapped? I would say, I, I don't have a percentage calculated for you, but I would say it was the majority of people. Because again, you work in the lab, you get assigned to, I think you're told, especially if you're working with animals, especially if you're new to working with animals, that this is important. You have to do it and you convince yourself of that. I mean, if you spend all day decapitating rats, which is what a lot of young experimenters have to do, you would have to tell yourself over and over again, well, I'm going to help humans one day. I'm going to help humans one day. So I think a lot of people get trapped. I think it's really only the elite, you know, maybe the top 10% of, of scientists, and I'll use that term, who are ambitious enough and thoughtful enough to say, what I'm doing here isn't working, or I'm not comfortable with it ethically, and I'm not going to do it. I think that is the minority of people. You may not have a choice though, right? Yeah. I mean, well, what? you always have a choice. I shouldn't, I don't want to suggest that somebody who's working in an animal lab can't get out. They can, but it's going to be effortful. It's going to be a challenge. It shouldn't be. It should absolutely be acceptable for anybody to say, I don't want to experiment on animals, but I do want to go into science and medicine. What is the path that I can take? But that is a, a very taboo position to take. And again, the younger you are, the more easily suppressed you would be, right? If if a bunch of scientists at your university say, you can't be opposed to animal experimentation. We do animal, you know, you're not really a good, you're not going to be a good scientist if you, if you think about the ethics of this. And people believe it, you know, because these are authority figures. These are people they respect. These are people who have had success in the industry. 
Um, so yeah, I think it's, I think there is always a choice and, and we do have people who, who absolutely say, I'm not going to do it, but I think that they are the minority. And it takes a certain courage. You have to go up against the, the establishment and essentially you are a heretic, right? Yes, it is. It is absolutely considered, um, your persona non grata, if you are willing to say that something that's so ingrained in the establishment is unacceptable and you have to be brave. I mean, we we talk about sometimes, I, I'm sure most people, I'm sure you are familiar, but probably a lot of your listeners are familiar with the, the experiments of Stanley Milgram, who was interested to see how people could be convinced to harm other people. And he brought people into the lab and he told them that they were going to shock other human beings and as part of a scientific inquiry. And fortunately, no people were actually shocked. I can't say that for animals who are, are shocked in labs, but many, many people, like 90% of the people who he brought into the lab were willing to shock their fellow human beings because they were told it was for science and I do think this is what happens to a lot of the undergraduates who go into a lab and somebody's there with a wet coat and says, you need to shock these mice or you need to shock these monkeys or you need to cut the heads off of these animals for science. And I think probably a similar percentage of people that Stanley Milgram saw who went along with it for humans would go along with it for animals. And it's only this very, very a uh, small percentage of people who say, hey, wait a second, wait, 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 I'm not okay with this, and walk out. It, it's almost as if, if you question, it's like you question your act or your right to question, and you go along. And so mm-hmm. it's a, there's a belief in the science that is so strong that it ends up being your mindset. You have to adopt it, and it's almost like a kind of culty. Kind it of, is. I think that's right. I think that is an and the the willingness to conform, right? The willingness to go along with the group. In the Milgram experiments, he had conditions where he had an individual come in and they had to decide by themselves alone whether they would shock people and how high how high a level of shock they would administer to these these humans who are actually confederates they weren't actually being shocked but they were screaming right so the so the person who was administering the shock absolutely believed that they were shocking people and hurting them because they could hear them screaming in the other room alone acting as an individual versus you sitting there with four other people and so stanley milgram set it up so that the 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 four other people who were in the room would all were like sure 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 i'll shock it and so the the people were e- even more likely to do it if everybody around them was comfortable. And again, that is the laboratory environment. If you're brought into an animal laboratory, everybody there is handling the animals. They're they're injecting the animals. They're experimenting on the animals. You know what I mean? This is now your group. And to say, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't think this is okay, is not conforming. And most people will conform. Well, what does that say about the validity of the science when everyone's in this group mentality how does it affect or impact the science and the credibility of the science is it even science at that point if if people are manipulated because that's what it sounds like yeah i think that that at least as far as as uh science based on animal experimentation we we already know that so much of that data that comes from non-human species isn't applicable to humans. We know this. I mean, there are thousands of papers documenting differences in species, failures of of new drugs and treatments that tested safe and effective in animals, but then fail in human trials. We know that the animal-based science is problematic, but people continue to do it. It's also not how what science is supposed to be, right? Science is supposed to be a continuously evolving continuously seeking out the newest, greatest, most accurate, most innovative methods. But that's not the reality, unfortunately. The reality is people do what they're told, people do what's socially acceptable, and people do what what they have been um, convinced is the best way for career advancement. And so, you know, the science, I always say that, that, 
people tend to put scientists on pedestals because we've gone to school for some X number of years, which we did, but scientists are just like anybody else. They have to worry about paying the rent. They have to worry about paying for their kids' braces. They have to worry about keeping their job. And that means they need to keep the grant money coming in and they need to keep the papers published and they need to keep... Scientists are just as flawed as anybody in any career path. They're just as likely to to gloss over something they're just as likely to make mistakes as anybody else and and we need to take scientists off that pedestal because it, it's it's a mistake you know the crazy thing to me is if they know it's wrong and they continue to do it it is this crazy exercise sort of mm-hmm. like you know almost like to bring up the cliche about einstein right the definition of insanity right mm-hmm. they, they keep doing it over and it we we're no closer to cures we're no closer to real scientific breakthroughs because it's really bad science we're just doing an exercise we're doing an exercise in not science but careerism or something like that yeah yeah, yeah. It's an extra, again, it's, it's the, it's, you know, you have to jump through all of these hoops and you have to, you know, meet these certain criteria. And somewhere along the way, and I, and I don't think any scientist or medical professional thinks this is what they're going to be doing when they start out. I think most people are, are ambitious, but they're ambitious towards really contributing to the field, meaning they're going to, develop new treatments or cures for humans, or they're going to acquire extremely important new knowledge. But what happens as, as we see again, in, in most fields is that the need to meet certain criteria that have nothing to do with how innovative your science is, that have nothing to do with how beneficial your research is to either the field or to human health, but rather, did you get this, did you get enough publications? Were they in a high impact journal? How much money from the federal government are you able to bring in? How many students have you pushed through? You know, all of these, all of these yardsticks, all of these, these milestones that you have to meet have little to do with the the quality of your science and more to do with your ability to do the business of science. Right. Two different things. Right. The business of science. Well, it just makes me wonder that all this effort and all this work for generations has created almost like a, a parallel sub science of, Hey, here's this thing. And it looks like science and it, but it hasn't created any breakthroughs, but Mm -hmm. it is the exercise. So our scientific minds are active. Meanwhile, in this real world of science where we're trying to find breakthroughs and trying to find solutions, oh, we haven't advanced at all. Or mm-hmm. we have, when we have, it's not because of the efforts of the subscience where they know that they, you know, this, you can't cross species. You can't, you know, you, you fail doing They're they're the exercise of science versus real science, the breakthrough yes. part. Yep. And that's I kind think of that's like right. the dual world. Now we have generations though, like you, you pointed out when you were an undergrad, you're still much younger than many people. Uh, the point is, we by now, we must have a, gener- a new generation of scientists who say, look, uh, we're done with this sub-science parallel universe kind of thing. We need to work in the real, the real world with real people where there are applications where we can't have breakthroughs. There's got to be some movement where those guys are winning versus the I other guys. So. I certainly hope so. The the thing that that uh, an obstacle we face is that all of those next generation scientists are being trained by last generation scientists who are trained by the generation before them scientists. So what we see all too often is that an experimenter say like, we can use me as a hypothetical example. It didn't happen this way, but it could have. I go into a monkey lab when I'm 19 and I start experimenting on monkeys. So then I graduate and I go to a grad school where they have a monkey lab and I spend six years working on a PhD in monkeys. Then I go and do a postdoc and then I have faculty. Now I've got my own students and I'm teaching them how to experiment on monkeys. And they're go- and we see this. I mean, we see this time and time again. We have, we have experimenters active now who are in their 70s experimenting on non-human primates 
who were trained by people who experimented on non-human primates and who are putting other experimenters out there who will now only know how to experiment on non-human primates. So it's a, I would say it was a gift that keeps on giving, but it's not a gift. It's it's a, a self-perpetuating nightmare for the animals because it 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 just breeds more people who are willing to do this even though it is ethically problematic and even though it is scientifically flawed. Well, it's also a waste, a waste of resources, a waste of time. If you know you're just doing a, you know, this, uh, like I said, you're, you're in this parallel universe where you're, you're acting like scientists, but you know that aren't there, I mean, they, people might, could say, to put a positive spin, well, you know, this is not totally wasteful because we see how these things work and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe an ounce of this can be used in the real world with real people to get real solutions. But is, is that pertinent or does that ever, ever really happen? Or is all of that science using the animals totally worthless? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer. So for a long time, before a lot of the new technologies that are available now were available, it was hard to look inside the human body. And so a lot of the earlier experiments with animals got more details about basic physiology, right? Things that are things that are comparable from one species to another. But the the reality we're facing now in terms of medical advancements is that we've basically tapped all of the species similarities that we can. And it's those differences that are what we need to understand and move away from in order to get at, you know, how do human diseases develop? How are human diseases best treated? How are human diseases best cured? Um, but again, the average scientist isn't looking for a new treatment or a cure for humans. They're just curious about physiology or it doesn't have to be physiology, but people who are working in, in biomedical research tend to be very curious about how the owl brain works or how the monkey brain works or how the rat, you know, gastrointestinal system works. And the fact that it's not ever going to translate into something you or I can benefit from is irrelevant to them. Right. I mean, that, and I guess that's really the point. I mean, who are we to, to put a kibosh on curiosity? Curiosity should be that that should be a great thing that we are curious about monkeys and animals and i mean i mean that that Not would be a curiosity just causes as much pain and suffering as as the curiosity that a lot of these animal experiments are trying to satiate right yeah. i'm all for curiosity in fact all of the research that i did with humans was curiosity based research it wasn't going to have a direct impact on human health it was what was classified as basic science research so somebody could hold me up to a to a microscope and say, you didn't cure any humans with the 20 plus years that you did with your research either. That's true. You know what else I didn't do? I didn't kill a bunch of animals, right? I didn't harm anybody. I just answered interesting questions about the human brain. I can accept that curiosity-driven research has a value, but does it have a value that's high enough to compensate for the extraordinary amount of suffering that these experiments tend to inflict on other animals. And my answer to that is, you know, unabashedly no. Well, also the breach of ethics, right? The breach of common humanity or a sense of humanity, a sense of the humane. Well, what you see too often, and it, it it's something that frustrates me more than I care to admit, but it really does frustrate me is that people who are doing these curiosity-driven experiments on animals, these extremely invasive experiments on animals, often deadly experiments on animals, when questioned about the ethics, like how do you justify? They'll then immediately pivot to the new cures and treatments for humans. Like, oh, well, you know, we've got people suffering with Alzheimer's disease, and even though their research has absolutely nothing to do with cancer or sepsis or or neuropsychiatric diseases, it's just curiosity-driven research. But they will justify it to the public by saying, oh, well, you know, but but we need to have this information. And people believe it because, again, 
they hear somebody who's a scientist at Harvard or Johns Hopkins or at NIH and assume, well, they wouldn't say that it was going to benefit me if it wasn't. Yes, they would. Yeah. It, it's, yes, they would. It's, and they do all the time. It, white coat intimidation is mm -hmm. what it is. And it's almost like yeah, from the gods, right? The science from mm -hmm. the gods and they are the gods. And all again, right. they are as flawed as anybody else. Yeah. They have the same expectations they need to meet. Yeah. So don't assume that somebody in a white coat has any more gravitas. Yeah. Yeah. They're not above it all. Certainly. No, well, they're well, not. Well, let's look at one specifically. Let's talk about uh, Margaret Livingstone at, at Harvard. Uh, she has been on the radar among PETA scientists is doing the wrong kind of science for years, but now there are these new strobe experiments on monkeys. I mean, I, I had to understand this and uh, I thought it was like strobe lights. They're, they're flashing lights like at a disco with these monkeys. No, it's not, it's not funny. It's real, but it's not it's lights. Funny. But what is, what, what is the strobe effect that she's simulating with the monkeys? Oh, this is a nightmare. So this, this is just for listeners. This is the same experimenter who PETA exposed as having taken baby monkeys away from their mothers. And in some experiments showing, sewing the baby's eyes shut for up to a year. But we recently got new documents from the NIH that tell us that in addition to, you know, sometimes sewing baby monkeys eyes shut for a year, she is now forcing these newborn infant monkeys to wear these specially made goggles that basically create a strobe like effect. So when you say like, oh, like a disco, that's the, the effect that they're having. They're basically wearing goggles that have shutters that turn that open and close at a really rapid rate. So they're having light and then dark and then light and then dark over and over and over again all day for a year and a half. So these baby monkeys taken away from their mothers, which we already know is like a disaster for them. They Monkeys who are taken away from their mothers like humans and don't have normal physical contact with their mothers have all kinds of psychopathology just from that, just from not being allowed to stay with their mothers as they would in nature. And now these experimenters at Harvard are forcing these monkeys to be having lights flashing on and off or darkness flashing on and off, if that's easier for people to understand. But just turn the lights on and off in your house for five minutes and see how annoying that is. And then imagine living like that for a year and a half, just so that they can see, oh, what does that do to the monkey's brains? Nothing good. That's the answer. Nothing yeah. good. Is there anything specifically they they could say that these monkeys were exposed? Maybe it has some human relevance that we can draw from. Or well, I don't know how many friends you have who were you know raised in a disco <laughs> and are suffering from that. But no, these these are the the epitome of curiosity driven experiments. In fact, Margaret Livingstone, the the lead investigator on these monkey torture experiments has been doing exactly this sort of thing since the 70s. Um, in some cases, she was using cats. She's moved on to monkeys. But it's all of these visual deprivation style experiments. These are experiments designed to see how the visual system develops if it's deprived of normal input. And so in addition to sewing monkeys' eyes shut, she's had experiments where she shows one eye shut or the other. Um, experiments where certain nerves are cut so that the eyes can't move properly. Uh, currently, there are experiments where the baby monkeys are being raised by people wearing welding masks, so they're deprived of any facial input. Uh, basically, this experimenter is spending 50 years and 30 million taxpayer dollars to have a career where she tries all different ways to mess up an animal's vision. It has no relevance to humans. Again, humans don't have their eyes sewn shut for a year. Humans are not raised by people wearing welding masks and humans do not spend a year and a half and in, in, in human years, that would be even longer in a strobe light. This is really just how many different ways can we alter the way the brain is supposed to develop naturally. It's all just, hey, isn't the brain cool? Yeah, the brain is cool, but we don't need to torture monkeys to look at how cool the brain is. This is all out of curiosity. And mm -hmm. when she goes from one, she goes from one species to the next. And at some point, 
the you have to wonder when she will stop being curious because it seems like at some point you have the answer or we can in we can instinctively you know uh, understand what the answer is but she must have the science to prove it i it doesn't make sense after a while this is this is this is the the one of the many you know maybe it's not a flaw but it it certainly is in this context the only way she's going to stop being curious about how many different ways she can alter an infant monkey's visual development is if the NIH and or Harvard says you can no longer be curious about this you know so if, if the if the funding is still available and if the university officials at Harvard decide that they don't care what this person does in her lab she can do all of the different experiments that she wants and and clearly that's what's happening here you know again th these are the sort of experiments that they conducted back in the 60s where they would sew kittens eyes shut and see how the visual cortex part of a brain uh is altered by not having normal visual input in the 60s and got answers in the 60s it's now 2023 so it's been 60 years since the discovery that altering visual input affects visual cortex. But but again, just these tiny little tweaks like, oh, she's going to do this for a year and a half, which is different than when they did it for four months. You know, these are the sort of little minuscule tweaks that make it new, but it's not new. And it's also torture. It's, it's animal torture. I can't. I don't know how to. Maybe because I've I've spent too much time reading about the negative effects of taking baby monkeys away from their mothers, but I have spent a lot of time, particularly looking at the work of Harry Harlow, um, also in the 60s. Uh, the devastation that taking an infant rhesus macaque, which is the sort of monkey that, that are being um, tortured at Harvard right now, and not allowing them to have social contact with their mother or their peers. The word devastation is the only word I can think of. People who are curious can look up monkeys from Harry Harlow Lab and see pictures of these tiny monkeys just crumpled, crumpled over because it's so devastating to their to their psychological development, but also their physical development. And this is the sort of procedure that that most people think no one does anymore. And in fact, when we exposed that this was happening at Harvard, nearly 400 scientists, including, you know, famous primatologist Jane Goodall, but scientists from around the world wrote to NIH and Harvard and said, are you kidding? Like, this is, this, this is not acceptable in today's day and age. We know all too well what taking babies away from their mothers will do to these animals. And we also know all too well what these different visual deprivation procedures are going to do how is this still allowed yeah and yet this continues what i guess academic freedom right i mean i i guess it's she's a researcher curiosity academic freedom you know I, this is, I think the scientific community in general doesn't like the public or even the government who funds them to uh, tell them what is or isn't good science or tell them where their scientific inquiry can go, though they want the public to pay for it, right? So they have no problem taking our taxpayer dollars and buying these monkeys or buying these goggles that do this stroke thing or flying to Paris to present this data at a conference. They take our money for that, but they don't want our input on whether what they're doing is you know, ethically acceptable or scientifically meaningful. And I don't think you can have it both ways. I don't think you can accept government funds, taxpayer funds to do your quote unquote science and then absolutely ignore what the public, and even in this case, the larger scientific community. In this case, the scientific community has said stop. Well, who thinks it's this stuff is cool aside from Margaret Livingstone? I mean, she's doing it what to to satisfy her own curiosity who's telling margaret livingstone keep doing it keep doing it this is the way you know this is the way we've always done it we can't give in you got to keep doing it. i mean why does it continue i think i think and if you're harvard and have to decide whether you let it continue what part what in part makes the decision is the 30 million dollars that have come to harvard 
to this experimenter. If they're going to get $30 million from NIH, I don't think they care one way or the other. Then the question is, how do we stop this in the future? How can we make sure that these kind of experiments can end and aren't going to happen again? We need a new generation of scientists. We need new science thinking. We need new science thinking, not just among the scientists, but at the universities and at NIH. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what's the plan? How, what is PETA doing? Pete is doing a lot of things. So for these specific set of experiments, um, obviously we are talking to the funding agencies, which include multiple institutes at NIH and Harvard. And, and if you want to learn more about those experiments, you can go to PETA.org slash Harvard. But bigger picture, you know, so, so uh, preventative measures, if you will, um, PETA scientists have, in fact, devised a strategy. It's called uh, the Research Modernization Deal. And that it, this is a very common sense strategy or roadmap, if you will, to phase out the use of these sorts of harmful and ineffective animal experiments, um, which includes things like asking the funding agencies to stop funding experiments on animals that we know are not working, you know, that have been proven time and time again. Um, it also includes increasing training so that if you are that young grad student who got stuck, assigned randomly into a animal lab, like I almost did, um, that there would be training money available. So you can say, yes, I'm doing my training with these mice, but I want to learn how to work with patients or I want to learn, you know, one of these other in vitro, these really cool in vitro tools. Um, and so people who want to support PETA's research modernization deal can go to PETA.org slash strategy, ask NIH and their members of Congress to take that seriously. Um, but yeah, I think also talking about it, this was never discussed when I was in undergraduate or even a graduate student. Now, part of that may be because I didn't end up in an animal laboratory. But what goes on inside these animal laboratories is not just hidden from the public. It's also hidden from the rest of the scientific community. So the number of conferences that I went to and seminars, webinars, we didn't have webinars back then because I'm old, but, but uh, talks, scientific discussions, journal articles, all of the, all of the medium that scientists get their information. If an animal experiment was involved, you never saw what that looked like. It was always like a cartoon picture of an animal or a picture of an animal in the wild. Like, oh, I did these experiments on monkeys. And then there's a picture of a monkey in a tree. You never see the picture of the monkey in the primate tree or with the head shaved and equipment screwed to his or her skull and wires coming out. You know, they don't show that even to the other members of the scientific community. So I think the harm part of all of this needs to be front and center. It needs to be part of every undergraduate and graduate course because people don't know. People don't know. So yeah, I think I think talking about it, asking yeah. questions, is yeah. this worth it? Yeah, we got to anybody you know. Yeah. We got to keep talking about it and because it's amazing how people how few the number of people who understand that this is going on. Mm -hmm. in our labs in, in at the highest levels of science and and the amount of money government money that's thrown at this and it continues and hopefully the new generation of scientists that you're going to help lead i i hope they're coming up and and the balance is tipping more in the favor of the new scientists i i hope i hope so too and i think that that's what is going to happen i do think this this younger generation at least it appears in other areas are, are willing to challenge the status quo, right? They're willing to say, this may be how you've always done things, but it's not okay. So I think that will help. Um, and of course, the, the fact that there are all these new modern, innovative, human relevant research methods that are available, I think will, will make a difference too. But again, you got to watch out because if you're being trained by a monkey experimenter, you have a pretty good chance of ending up being a monkey experimenter yourself. So anybody, anybody out there who's thinking about pursuing a career in science or medicine, don't assume that you're going to be able to transition away from animal experiments. Get into the human relevant research now. In many ways, we're all being trained by the monkey exper 
experimenters, not just the scientists, but the public, because we're cowed into thinking that what they're doing is right. Oh, of course. And the news media doesn't help, right? Because you'll say, oh, we've got a new cure for X, Y, or Z. And then it turns out it's something they learned in mice or rats, and it never becomes anything that's going to help us. But people forget that. They just see the headline, right? The media needs to do a better job of qualifying these discoveries in mice and rats and monkeys because those discoveries in mice and rats and monkeys have very little to do with what what humans need. So at the very base level, uh, non-scientists like me, we need to know the real story behind what oh, science yeah. do is your, good Do your own homework. Yeah, absolutely. Do not believe the headlines. And and the headlines won't even mention mice or rats or monkeys sometimes. It'll just say, oh, scientists at you know Harvard have discovered, you know, some new vision. And you're like, oh, that's cool. Read the read the fine print. At read the fine print and know that if it was not a human-based study, it has probably got nothing to do with you. It's not going to help you. And it was probably extremely harmful for the animals. That won't be in that article either. It'll sound cute. Oh, they studied vision in monkeys. No, no. They they took babies away from their mothers, forced them to live in a strobe light environment for a year and a half, and then cut into their skulls. They so, won't put that in the article. Yeah. But that's science. That's the way science is done, and it shouldn't be done that way. Dr. Catherine Rowe, I appreciate you just laying it down for our audience about what, what it's all about. And really, thank you for being part of the PETA podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Dr. Catherine Rowe is the chief of the Science Advancement and Outreach Division within the Laboratory Investigations Department at PETA. For more information on stopping the Harvard experiments of Margaret Livingstone, go to PETA.org. Also, go there for more information how to change the system with the research modernization deal that PETA is backing and advocating for. Go to PETA.org. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at AMOK.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F.org slash blog. Or get this podcast on YouTube at Amila Muck One. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights, and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.